Good morning, dear students. Today we have uh, come to, uh, to discuss about the topic which is called autosclerosis. Now, before we go into the subject proper, I want you to revise the basic anatomy of the ear, the external ear, uh, the middle ear and the inner ear. <coughs> now, our concentration is on the middle ear and the inner ear part and as you know, <coughs> the middle ear cavity uh, consists of these uh, three bones, the malleus, the incus and the stapes and the stapes is the bone which covers the whole window and it opens into the scala vestibuli there are three chambers in the inner ear the scala vestibuli scala media and scala tympani okay so the whole window <coughs> opens into the whole uh, uh, the whole window when the foot plate of the stapes vibrates. You have the vibrations transmitted into the scala vestibuli, and these in turn at the helicotrema send a wave in the reverse direction and ultimately <coughs> are let out in the, the round window, which is covered by the secondary tympanic membrane. Now this is the basic mechanism of hearing. Now uh, why we are discussing about the basic mechanism is today's uh, condition autosclerosis is a condition where there is some kind of a obstruction to the, the vascular vibrations and the vibrations, the sound vibrations are being stopped from uh, being sent into the scala vestibula. Okay? And the process there and, and the condition is called the autosclerosis. If you go into the definition of this autosclerosis, it's a primary disease of the aortic capsule in which irregular spongy bone replaces the dense endochondral layer of the aortic capsule. Now, thereby fixing the foot plate of the stapes and causing conductive hearing loss. That is the definition. Now, if you try to understand what this conveys us is the what is the aortic capsule? Aortic capsule is nothing but this uh, bone, the strong bone which covers the labyrinth. And this consists of three parts: the vestibular, vestibule, the semicircular canals, and the cochlea. Now, uh, that is the aortic capsule. In this aortic capsule, there are some uh, areas which are uh, likely to develop uh, or develop a kind of a spongy bone at a later, later age. Now new bone formation is spongy and if it is vascular it is called active autosclerosis. If it is thicker and more cellular it is called inactive autosclerosis. Now we have studied about the mechanism, basic mechanism of sound traveling. And uh, we go a little deep into the <coughs> middle ear cavity, wherein uh, the uh, medial surface of the middle ear cavity, you have some important structures starting from the oval window. The aortic capsule, as I told you, is the bony part of the labyrinth, and uh, it has got two openings one is the oval window, and the other one is the round window. And just above the oval window, which is covered by the foot plate of the stapes, is the facial nerve, the horizontal part of the facial nerve. And just above that is the prominence of the lateral semicircular canal. And as we know, the most bulging part of the medial ball of the middle ear cavity is the uh, promontory. 
and this is formed by the basal turn of the cochlea. With this brief, uh, 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 yeah, and there is another uh, branch of the vagus, uh, sorry, the facial nerve, which is called the cauda tympani, which travels in the middle ear cavity, which travels in the middle ear cavity and is uh, in between uh, the uh, malleus and the long process of the ingus. Now, we also see in the posterior part, there is a small eminence and which is called the pyramidal eminence, wherein you have the stapedius muscle and with its tendon and this tendon is inserted into the neck of the uh, foot plate, uh, neck of the stapes. Okay? And this is the one which controls the movement uh, of the, uh, suppose there is a loud sound that is being produced, the vibrations are cut off by uh, the contraction of the stapedius muscle, which in turn pulls the foot plate of the stapes away from the vestibular um, uh, region. Now, there is uh, the cauda tympani is another nerve, of course, which is a branch of the facial nerve which travels in the middle ear cavity. So, with this brief uh, uh, brushing of the uh, basic anatomy, we go into the uh, disease proper. And uh, if you go into the history of the autosclerosis in 1704, the Valsalva was the first one who described about the stapes fixation. Then, uh, 1857, joint be linked stapes fixation to the hearing loss. He found that there is some kind of fixation of the stapes which is leading to the hearing loss. And 1890, Cuts was first to find microscopic evidence of the autosclerosis. And 1893, Pollitzer described the clinical entity which is called the autosclerosis. Now, when we go into the etiological factors uh, the exact etiology is not known, which is called idiopathic. As I told you, the remnants of the embryonic cartilage resting in the otic capsule, otic capsule uh, become active and that may be one of the causes. Then you have the heredity uh, which runs in families and it is by the autosomal dominant. And the third one is the hormonal, uh, it is influenced by the hormones. And uh, during pregnancy, there is and menopause, there is a increased activity of this autosclerotic focus. Then you have these uh, syndromes, uh, Van der Hoef's syndrome, wherein osteogenesis imperfecta, the autosclerosis, and blue sclera. And uh, then you have the uh, conditions associated with Page's disease. Both these osteogenesis uh, imperfecta and the Page's disease, there is a newborn formation which is not very strong and it breaks, people have repeated uh, fractures. Now there is another theory which is called the enzymatic theory, wherein there is imbalance in the trypsin and antitrypsin in the inner fluids, which initiates the process of the autosclerosis. Then there are some uh, metabolic and immune disorders and then you have the anatomical and histological anomalies of the temporal bone. The otic capsule, as you know, is a part of the, it's in, embedded in the uh, temporal bone. Now, recently there is a kind of a relationship that has been established uh, uh, between the measles virus and the development of autosclerosis because they found the uh, immunoglobulins IgG uh, uh, and against the measles that have been dissect, uh, detected in the uh, in the ray of fluids. Now, coming to the incidence, it's about 0.5 to 1% of the total population. The females to male ratio is 2 is to 1. And usually it affects the age group or it manifests in the age group 20 to 40 years. And it's common in some of the races like the white races, common in India. And it's low in Chinese and Japanese. Usually it's a bilateral disease. Now we will try to see what exactly are the different types of autosclerosis. Now autosclerosis is usually classified into these uh, 
types. First one is the stapedial autosclerosis, wherein the foot plate of the stapes is the one that is affected. Second one is the cochlear autosclerosis, where there is a new spongy bone formation along the uh, uh, along the vestibule into the inner ear via the oval window through the oval window. And the third one is the malignant autosclerosis, wherein you have the uh, autosclerotic folks, uh, sensory neural deafness, which rapidly progresses and damages the entire ear. Uh, then you have the combined, that is the stapedial and cochlear autosclerosis. And you have another condition which is called the histological autosclerosis, wherein the histological autosclerosis you have uh, uh, the histologically you will be able to identify but there is no clinical manifestation now let us go back into the stapedial autosclerosis wherein there are certain areas in the old window around the old window which is called uh, uh, and if we go into the small anatomy brushing of the anatomy here the uh, stapes has got the head the neck and the anterior and foot posterior cura and you have the stapes foot plate these are the components of the stapes now there are certain areas which are prone to the autosclerotic focus one is the anterior uh, uh, anterior focus as you see in the diagram one is the posterior focus the third one is the circumferential all around and the uh, fourth one is the, the biscuit type where the entire foot plate of the stapes becomes thick and uh, another condition which is wherein type wherein there is a complete obliteration of the entire foot plate of the stapes also encroaching onto the crura of the foot uh, the stapes so these are the types that are um, described as far as the stapedial autosclerosis is concerned then we go to the cochlear autosclerosis wherein it involves the region of the round window and then proceeds into the labyrinth through the, uh, into the oval window and uh, here there may, may not be abscess, uh, the abscess uh, there is abscess of uh, stapes fixation and uh, the sensory neural hearing loss is due to the liberation of toxic material from the abnormal bone into the ear so there is a sensory neural deafness in a cochlear autosclerosis as we earlier said, the malignant autosclerosis is a severe type wherein it starts early in life and progresses very rapidly. And you have the other, the combined mixed hearing loss wherein you have the mixed, that is the uh, stapedial as well as the, uh, the cochlear autosclerosis. Then as I said, the histological autosclerosis which is usually 9 to 12 percent of the cases where there are no clinical features but histologically the focus is present this is being detected detected uh, the postmortem okay <coughs> then we go to the pathology what really happens in the bone a grossly it appears as a chalky white gross picture is the uh, chalky white yellow focus or red in color due to increased vascularity which is active the microscopically in immature that is the active focus there are numerous marrow and vascular spaces with plenty of osteoblasts and osteoclasts which stain the blue on uh, hematoxylin eosin stain it's called blue mantle and uh, the second one is the, the mature or inactive fo uh, focus uh, there is a vascular spaces are decreased less and a lot of fibrous tissue which stains red on hematoxylin and eosin stain. That is as far as the microscopic appearance of the autosclerotic focus is concerned, gross and microscopic. Then we go into the clinical features, the symptoms with which the patient usually comes to us. The one is the uh, hearing loss. It may be a conductive if it is stapedial, sensory neural if it is cochlear, mixed if it is both. Uh, step, uh, the stapedial and cochlear mixed kind of hearing loss. Then associated with that you have the tinnitus and vertigo uh, because the the autosclerotic focus is slowly proceeding into the labyrinth. Then 
these people usually have a voice which is monotonous, well modulated and soft speech. This is because the patients, they hear their own voice which is called autoph autophonia and uh, uh, so when they are speaking there is so much of feedback that they have so they try to cut down their voice and so the, they have a well modulated soft speech. Now uh, paracusis will see this is another manifestation wherein the patient hears better in hearing noisy sur sur surroundings because in noisy surroundings uh, people tend to speak at a higher amplitude. Now we go to the clinical features the presentation of the patient with those uh, com complaints then we go into the clinical features to see uh, uh, and number one is the tympanic membrane which is usually normal but sometimes when there is active uh, focus of uh, the autosclerosis wherein you have the spongy bone interspersed with the uh, blood vascularity you on the promontory you see a pink or red colored uh, color this is called the short sign or flamingo pink blush then usually a uh, conductive type of deafness wherein you have the various methods of doing uh, uh, the tuning fork test the impedance audiometry uh, the Q-tone audiometry uh, and you see by uh, testing doing these tests the first one is the tuning fork test the release the stepidial cochlear and mix it there are they vary uh, because stepidial is the one which uh, autosclerosis is the one which gives rise to conductive deafness wherein you have any negative rebus is lateralized to the deaf ear and abc is normal whereas in the cochlear and mix it <coughs> it lateralized it is positive and uh, uh, in the cochlear, whereas in the mixed it is negative, the release is negative. And uh, then there are other tests which are uh, done when you do a tuning fork, tuning fork test, wherein you vibrate the tuning fork and put it on the mastoid uh, bone and you close the external artery meatus. This is called the Bing test. And in autosclerosis, there is no change. <coughs> Whereas in the normal hearing, there is a or sensory neural hearing loss, there is an intensity increases. And another test which is called the Gillies test, wherein the external artery canal, the tuning fork is vibrated and put it on the mastoid bone, and the external artery uh, canal is uh, the, the increase in the pressure increased, pressure is increased by doing a procedure called siegelization and in this the Gillies test there is no change in autosclerosis whereas the normal or sensory neural hearing loss the intensity decreases. Then we go to the Q-tone audiometry wherein uh, there is a, a conductive type of deafness and uh, the stapes fixation uh, uh, is there and uh, there is a notch of the bone conduction which is at the 2000 deaths. It is also present in um, 500 and 1000 but to a minimal extent and to the uh, at 4000 heads also uh, it comes, comes back. Now 2000 frequency is the one which is uh, uh, called the Karhat's notch which is uh, almost diagnostic of a autosclerotic focus of the uh, stepidial uh, region. And uh, the notch, Kerhat's notch is usually explained by the fixation of the uh, stapes disrupts the normal ossicular resonance. So at 2000 Hz, that is there is the normal resonance of the, uh, the ossicles. So that is being interfered and so you have the notch uh, decrease at the 2000 heads. Now there is <coughs> another uh, explanation that is being given is the normal compression mode of the bone conduction 
being disturbed because of the relative perilymph immobility. That is, the foot plate of the tape is, <coughs> is uh, totally uh, immobile. Of course, uh, the, another is the mechanical artifact. And this Karhat's notch at 2000 heads, the dip, uh, reverses itself when we do the stepidectomy or stepidotomy. Now, then we go to the speech audiometry, wherein <coughs> the speech audiometry is normal, but the only thing is speech reception threshold uh, intensity uh, is increased by uh, the amount of conductive hearing loss. Then we go to the impedance audiometry, which measures the pressure changes in the middle ear cavity. And uh, here we see uh, A is the normal. Uh, and we have this uh, uh, autosclerosis, you have uh, the A's type of curve, wherein the compliance is increased. Compliance in the sense, it is the, uh, it is the resistance that is offered by the, uh, the, uh, by the air column that goes and vibrates the tympanic membrane and the ossicles. So there is a resistance. So that is detected by the impedance audiometry, which is called the tympanometry. <coughs> then we go into the differential diagnosis, uh, wherein you have a conductive deafness, various conditions, the ossicular discontinuity, the congenital fixation stapes, stapes, the malleus head fixation, the Paget's disease and osteogenesis imperfecta, wherein there is, in both these conditions, there is a newborn formation which is very pretty. Then of course the various other conditions which can also give rise to conductive deafness like the middle ear fluid, the tympanal sclerosis and so on. Then we go to the natural history, what really happens into the, uh, how the disease progresses. 90% of all cases are, um, are never clinically apparent and the focus usually begins in the childhood and commonly becomes manifest in the third and fourth decades and after clinical presentation either there is a conductive deafness uh, uh, the, uh, and then you have a periodic uh, quiescence and then there is activity of the spongy bone formation again and then further deterioration and slowly this progresses episode, uh, in kinds of episodes and during pregnancy because of the hormones that are released there is active the activity of the uh, autoscleric focus increases and so further worsens. Now, associated sensory neural hearing loss also occurs if the autoscleric focus goes into the cochlear um, spaces. Then we go to the uh, treatment of uh, the autosclerosis. There are the mainstay is the sodium fluoride tablet which is uh, 20 milligrams and which is usually given uh, once or sometimes uh, it is given twice a day 20 milligrams for three to three months to two years. The function of this uh, sodium chloride is to um, is to hasten the maturity of the active focus and uh, arrest the further progression of the cochlear loss. And uh, the indications are the cochlear autosclerosis and the active stepidial autosclerosis before you uh, uh, take up for surgical procedures. Then the side effects of these uh, are the fracture of the long bones because the fluoride is the one which gets deposited in, in, in place of the calcium. So uh, the bones are, they become something like a fluorosis so they become brittle and uh, it is also the effect on the kidneys and the gastric mucosa. The contraindications for this therapy are the pregnancy and lactation and patients with kidney stones and nephritis. That is as far as the medical treatment is concerned. This is only to arrest the further uh, progress of the disease. Now, if you go into the history of the surgical management, Lempert was the one who first uh, 
uh, popularized the single stage fenestration in the horizontal canal with a tissue graft covering. Now, he has not done anything to the focus of the uh, uh, or to the foot plate. So, he has bypassed that and the, uh, the as you as we have seen, the, in the editors you have the, the horizontal semicircular canal. So, he has made a fenestration and that is covered by tissue graft. Uh, and in such cases, they found that the complete closure of the AB, uh, the AB gap is not totally closed. So, then it was Rosen who stabilized, uh, the, uh, mobilized the stapes foot plate. So, and he mobilized the stapes foot plate and uh, left it at that. And uh, once the, um, so the, the procedure was over, uh, it, uh, the problem was the, there was improved hearing at the time of uh, the uh, mobilization. But uh, there is the problem was it got refixed again. Then it was Shia who in 1956 first performed the stepidectomy operation. And uh, he has uh, the old window is covered by the, the entire stapes foot plate is removed. The old window is covered by vein graft and a process is uh, placed between the incus to the old window. Then we have uh, Shia has uh, modified in 1962 uh, instead of taking out the entire foot plate of the stapes said we will do a operation wherein there is a perforation that is fenestra that is made in the uh, stapes foot plate and through which the process is uh, inserted and later there were some problems because of the mechanical uh, instruments that are being used in order to make a perforation into the foot plate of the stapes. Laser stepidotomy has become popular by, uh, which has been popularized by the Perkins and Di Bartolomeo in 1980. Now, the stepido stepidectomy is the one wherein you have to uh, follow certain criteria before you take them up for surgery. Now, pewter on average uh, should be between 30 and 60 decibels and airborne gap has to be 20 decibels, that is the uh, airborne gap is important and speech discrimination score should be about 60 percent and there should be, there should be, uh, should not be any uh, sensory neural deafness because there is no point in doing uh, a stepidectomy procedure and there is a uh, sensory neural deafness. Then the contraindications for surgery are the only hearing ear, if that is the only ear which is uh, hearing, then stepidectomy is not performed. And whenever there is an infection in the middle ear cavity, you don't do a stepidectomy. The extremes of age, younger than maybe 10 years and older than 70 years. The menius disease is another contraindication. Otitis is external because we don't want the infection to go from the external uh, ear into the middle ear cavity and infect the uh, stepidectomy site. And pregnancy because there is activity of uh, autoscleritic focus during the time. And uh, it should not be done in professionals who are divers, the scuba diving, etc. And uh, the high construction workers, uh, people who uh, go to high altitudes and frequent travelers, uh, air particularly, air travelers and people who are exposed to loud sounds. These are the contraindications of a stepidectomy. <coughs> the surgical procedures that are being done uh, are summarized in this um, uh, small um, slide presentation wherein initially you make a uh, incision in the external artery metal skin about 6 millimeters from the tympanic annulus and then elevate the flap, tympanomiatal flap and uh, ultimately go to the tympanic uh, uh, annulus, elevate the annulus from the sulcus then uh, 
you will be seeing the quadrate tympani and which is pushed to one side then you have <coughs> you will see the incudostapial joint if you are not able to see the incudostapial joint you may have to remove a part of the posterior part of the uh, external artery uh, neatal canal so that the visualization of the incudostapial joint is clear then once you have the uh, visualization uh, of the incudostapial joint uh, you will also see the uh, tendon of the uh, stapes okay uh, and stapedial tendon which is uh, divided and uh, you slowly dislocate the incudostapedial joint incudostapedial joint and uh, you uh, drill out the anterior and posterior crura make them thin and then remove the suprastructure stape is suprastructure then only the foot plate of the stape is, is visible and into this foot plate of the stape is on that you place a vein graft and uh, uh, then <coughs> a process is placed uh, connecting the uh, long process of the incus and the uh, the scala vestibuli and uh, then you go into the uh, the complications that are described intraoperative complications are the foot floating the foot plate that is when you are trying to pierce the or take out the foot plate of the stapes uh, it sometimes slips into the into the scala vestibuli and uh, sometimes in the procedure you may dislocate the incus and uh, when you are raising the tympanomatal flap there may be rupture of this for a tympanic membrane and sometimes the facial nerve uh, as you know which is which runs just above the foot plate of the stapes may be uh, without the, which, uh, there is a deficient uh, in the facial canal and the, foot, the facial nerve may be partly covering the foot plate of the stapes uh, so uh, that has to be taken care and the cordia tympani is the nerve facial nerve a branch which runs in the middle ear cavity has to be taken care. Then you have the uh, persistent stapedial artery uh, which which runs on the foot plate of the stapes, a branch from the middle meningeal artery, uh, which sometimes when uh, uh, injured can give rise to a kind of a bleeding which will disturb the surgeon. Now then you have uh, once you make an opening into the foot plate of the stapes the perilymph this is cala vestibular uh, the perilymph sometimes is under pressure and so there is flooding of the perilymph perilymphatic which is called the perilymphatic pressure and uh, <coughs> which can sometimes give rise to a complete dead ear the post operative complications are the the otitis media uh, uh, which are the infections which are common with any surgical procedure the old window granuloma there is some kind of an infection there and then a granuloma forms and sometimes the perilymph fistula the fistula that is uh, when the foot plate of the stapes is removed the perilymph starts slowly leaking into the middle ear cavity then you have the sensory neural hearing loss as i told you because the perilymph uh, cushion the entire scalar media becomes scalar vestibuli becomes empty and so that gives rise to a sensory neural hearing loss persistent airborne gap uh, because of either failure to place the processes the process properly or sometimes during the when you are uh, replacing the tympanic membrane the process has been displaced then uh, the vestibular dysfunction because the inner ear fluids the infection can spread and gives rise to the vestibular dysfunction and delayed facial palsy in laser surgery where sometimes the uh, the damage the can uh, give rise to a facial palsy then those people who are unfit for surgery wherein we have already, already mentioned and who refuse surgery the modality of treatment is by hearing aid
I'll try to show you a small clip of uh, uh, the procedure of uh, the stepidectomy. Uh, this is an animation that is. Yeah. So, this is the tympanic membrane. You see the malleus, the incus, and the stapes, and the white one is the autosclerotic focus. Now, you that is the tympanic membrane, and the moment is being convert is being transmitted but it's not able to vibrate the stapes foot plate because that is ankylosed then you tympanometal flap is elevated and you dislocate the inferior joint and test for the mobility of the malleus and incus okay and the inferior joint that is the joint which is being separated then you cut the tendon is stepidial tendon. The anterior and posterior crura are weakened by the laser and a drill machine is applied to further weaken and the stapes suprastructure is removed. Then the foot plate of the stapes you again make uh, um, with the use of la laser you make uh, stepidotomy and make it into a single opening and cover it by the uh, vein graft and then you take the process which is uh, of the adequate length measured by a measuring jig uh, which is not shown here but anyway uh, the the process is connecting the long uh, the the vestibule along with the long process of the incus, how it is hooked on the long process. And so that is how the uh, stepidectomy surgical procedure or stepidotomy procedure is done. Uh, I hope you have understood and try if you have uh, any doubts you can go through the video again and try to uh, clear your doubts. Thank you.